지난한지 5개월 만에 미국 미네소타로 입양된 강금주 씨는 대학에서 철학을 전공했고 의대에 진학합니다. 현재 출산을 앞두고 있는 그는 산부인과 의사가 되면서 친어머니의 고통과 사랑을 동시에 이해하게 됐다고 말합니다. 여러분 안녕하십니까? 한국보건복지부 산하 아동권리보장원과 미주중앙일보가 공동 제작하고 있습니다. 루킹포맘 투게더의 최인성입니다. 오늘 루킹포맘 투게더는 사만다 페이스 강금주 씨를 만나봅니다. 줌으로 초대합니다. 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Everything's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Now, I understand <laughs> you just got out of your long duty, long graveyard shift. Are you okay? I am okay. Yeah, I just completed a 24-hour shift in the hospital. Okay. I just briefly mentioned that you went to medical school and became an OBGYN. Please yeah. introduce yourself to us, to our um, viewers, please. My name is Samantha Pace. Uh, I'm a Korean adoptee adopted to Minnesota. My Korean name was Kang, well, is Kang Kung Ju. And I've uh, lived in Minnesota since 1979. And I uh, went to medical school and became an OBGYN. And now I work at our county hospital here, Hennepin County Medical Center. I take care of a lot of um, refugee and low income and marginalized populations. So it's a very satisfying career for me. I see. I understand. And I can imagine that you delivered a baby like this many times. Now, do you remember how many babies you delivered so far? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> People ask me that. It's got to be... <laughs> Uh, thousands. I can't. I can't even remember. But we delivered four babies last night. Yeah. I do have your delivery certificate from the the clinic when you were born in Korea, oh. and also have this uh, Eastern Child Welfare Society paperwork that you are when you are ready to be adopted overseas. Now, as far as you know. And you researched so far, uh, what were the circumstances and also surroundings and also even the other story that you know about when you were uh, ready to be adopted? According to the social history, I was born at Meng Maternity Home in Jinju City. And um, I've heard two different stories. The social history that I have says my mom was in my, was in her early 30s, but then I think another document has said that she was 40, which seems a little less likely, but um, she was in her early 30s. She delivered me on September 5th, 1978. She was alone and she left shortly after um, delivery and asked that I be adopted to a nice home. Uh, And I believe I stayed at a foster home very briefly before mm. being sent to Eastern Child Welfare Society in Seoul. I see. Now, I noticed the two things on your paperwork. The one thing is they mentioned that uh, 78 September 5th is the accurate DOB. Never seen this word accurate there. I have seen mm -hmm. many paperworks of KD friends out there. But they never said accurate because they are 100% sure they were, you were born in that day, right? The second thing is your last name was from your birth mom. Supposedly. That's what it, that's what it says. So are, are you 100% sure about these two things? If you don't trust this fact, why not? As far as I know, I trust it. I don't have any reason not to. Um, I, I could imagine that she might not have used her real name, though, if she never wanted to be found. She didn't leave her given name. And um, I was marked as illegitimate. So I... That would be the only reason why I would wonder if it was her real name, depending on how much anonymity she wanted. I see. Now, that leads us to the next question. Have you able to reach out to Meng or have you had any research with this uh, Eastern to figure out 
the date DOB is accurate and your last name was possibly handed down from your birth mom? I have worked with NCRC and actually a friend of mine who is a native Korean and goes back um, like yearly and he told me that Mang Maternity Home it no longer exists. And I believe he visited NCRC on my behalf. Um, and uh, through the NCRC, I think they've asked Eastern Child Welfare Services for what records I have. And I haven't gotten anything additional from what I have now. Now I have a beautiful picture uh, I can smile upon your adopted mom. Yeah. Such a wonderful woman. She always made our birthdays very special. <laughs> Santa did you met. Is this your adopted father or grandpa? No, that's my adopted father. He was 47 years old when I, see. I was adopted. Everybody thought he was my grandfather oh, okay. every time he took me out. But little, yeah, he's my dad. Cake with a birthday party, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. And I do know they're all past. I I am really sorry yeah. to hear that. Yeah. So tell us how you grew up here. Uh, how about the adopted families and siblings? How was it? So I was adopted to a very middle class family. My dad worked on the railroad. He graduated high school. Um, my mom actually never graduated high school. Um, tragically, they tried to have their own child, but then she actually had a stillbirth around six mm -hmm. months. Uh, and the doctor told her she was too unhealthy to have her own children. Um, she wasn't unhealthy, but pregnancy was ri too risky for her. Mm -hmm. And so then they, um, being in Minnesota, I think it was one of the bigger areas where Korean adoptees were being sent to and so one of her relatives suggested why didn't you consider adopting overseas and she had already been a foster mom for local babies but um she was always really heartbroken every time she had to give the children up yeah so um she actually adopted my sister three years before me from korea um not biologically related and then my sister kept saying she wanted <laughs> sibling so I was kind of adopted to keep her company and um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom and uh, my dad worked a lot and she actually homeschooled us I was really? homeschooled from mm -hmm. yeah I was okay. homeschooled from third to twelfth grade my sister from I think seventh to twelfth grade um, and so uh, you know, they were hardworking. My mom was pretty strict and not going to college herself and not graduating high school. She really pushed the education for us. And she was always like, college, 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 everything else can wait. Um, she was, I think because she was older and fairly strict, most of my friends actually tend to be Asian or um not necessarily American, uh, just given how strict my mom's upbringing was. Uh, she's enrolled us in piano. Both my sister and I took piano lessons, at least through high school. I quit in high school, but my sister continued um, with a PhD in music. Mm. Um, and then I decided that instead of music, I wanted to pursue medicine. Um, yeah, we went to the University of Minnesota mm. for undergrad and medical school. And then I did residency at the University of Chicago. And then at the end of residency, my parents were pretty old. So I came back home to uh, help support them. I see. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I didn't know you went through homeschooling, but uh, I mean, just out of curiosity, homeschooling to philosophy major, then medical school? Mm -hmm. How do you explain that, please? <laughs> well, when you homeschool, you do have to meet the yearly criteria to show that you are meeting the state standards for education. And 
again, my mom was almost like a tiger mom, a white tiger mom, (laughs) but she really pushed us to get good grades and um, always wanted us to strive to be the highest we could achieve. Um, You know, with my dad working so much, pretty much, um, I mean, my mom really shaped who I've become, but I did with my dad's work, I, I don't I don't know anyone who works harder than my dad. He has such a, such a hard work ethic. So, yeah. I would call your mom, uh, Angel Tiger, if I'm not, if I'm not, (laughs) Angel Tiger. Okay. Uh, next thing is now you came, uh, became a OBGYN. It's not easy job, obviously a lot of work, ton of emotions, uh, labors, labors. Now you you told us that you found your own motivation to search for your birth mom because of your your work. Now how did I mean how did it is related but how did you find your own motivation from your work? Well, and it, my first search actually happened when I was 18, 19 years old. And I feel like that's when I went to the university and my world obviously coming from being homeschooled to going to a big 10 university with like 40,000 undergraduate students. Um, my world really expanded. My identity expanded. I, um, I think that's when I really started questioning my heritage, where I came from, any, any kind of biological connection I could find. And that was not a very successful search. Um, and so then, of course, I got busy with school and oh, yeah. training and everything. And then, yeah, going into OBGYN, I, I did it more for the nature of the field and the nature of the work. But obviously, how can I not think about my own origins and my own birth? And um, I've had the privilege of taking care of a few women who have also given up their own children for adoption. And those are always really um really special patients for me to take care of. Um, And then, and then actually when my mom got sick after my dad passed, um, it sort of brought me back to the idea of, can I find another, another person in my family, my biological family? Um, And also, as I get older, I realize the risk that potentially my biological birth mother might not be alive anymore. And, um, but yeah, being involved in maternity and pregnancy and um, sometimes difficult social situations, which happen a lot at the county, it always makes me wonder what her story was, how she managed through a nine month pregnancy you know, who was her support system, all of the emotions she must have felt, probably fear as, you know, you come up to delivery and, um, I see. Yeah. Wow. Now, uh, that leads us to another stock, the stock that's going to bring us a beautiful baby. Tell us about it. What's, did you name her yet or did you name him yet? Oh, my pregnancy. (laughs) Oh, yes. Um, Well, ironically, I've struggled with infertility for a really long time. Um, But I definitely wanted to experience what it was like. So I am nine weeks away from delivery now. Okay. And it's a boy. And... We're still working on a name. It's really hard. <laughs> and it really, truly takes nine months to get used to the idea that you're going to become a parent. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's say you, I still hypothetical. Now, let's say you sit down with your birth mom somewhere in Jinju or Seoul. Now, imagine that. Now, I want you to tell us what you're going to tell her. For the very first time, very first time, sitting on your table, please. 
I've never actually let myself go that far in my imagination. Um, I probably just want to look at her for such a long time and see what she actually looks like. I've always wondered what it would be like to see myself somehow reflected in someone else. If she, I mean, that could be awkward <laughs> if she let me look at her. Um, I want to thank her for um, actually, you know, she, I could have stayed in Korea. I could have gone anywhere, but she said she wanted to adopt me out. So I've had a very fortunate life. I have very few regrets. I want to tell her that um, I'm happy with where I am and, um, I would hope that she was also happy with her choice. Um, I'd really want to know who she is as a person, what her personality is like, what her preferences are. There's always that question of nature versus nurture, and um, I probably want to know if she thought about me or wondered what happened to me. Um, I don't know how possible it is for birth mothers to look for their children in Korea once they adopt them out. I suspect it's probably just as difficult as my route. Um, I just want to know about her life and what she's done, what she's proud about, what she's sad about. Um, what her family looks like now. I tell her about my world. Maybe you could show her her grandchild. Okay. You okay, Samantha? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Working for 24 hours doesn't do a lot for your emotional <laughs> stability either. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know how you feel. I'm sure she's somewhere out there thinking of you and waiting for you. So let's do our best to help your journey. Uh, what is your plan? Where is your journey going? Um, what is your next step? Tell us. Oh, I mean, I'm looking, of course, at maternity leave and... Um, you know, September through December. And uh, I had initially had an invitation to go to Korea to be on some okay. television show okay. to help find my biological mom. But then COVID happened mm. and then my mom got sick. Okay. So um, I don't know if that's still a possibility, but that would need to be delayed. What was delivery and everything. Um, I think my path right now leads forward. The farther and the older I get, I, I think there's going to be a limited amount of chance that I have to look backwards. There's always a possible chance maybe of finding half siblings or um, I see. other relatives though. Got it. Uh, thanks for your time and I hope for the best and um, we'll keep in touch. So if you happen mm -hmm. to hit the um, uh, Incheon Airport somewhere uh, around maybe, I don't know, next year, right? Let right. Us, let us know and uh, maybe we can help you out there. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Thanks for your time, Samantha. We'll keep in touch. Thank you so much. 강금주 씨, 네, 대화를 나눴습니다. 강금주 씨, 사만다 페이스. 네. 사무과 의사로 일을 하고 있고요. 엄마, 아이 모두 건강하게 순산하길 진심으로 진심으로 바라겠습니다. 자, 방금 이야기를 마친 강금주 씨, 사만다 페이스 씨를 혹시 여러분들 알고 계십니까? 
강금주 씨, 사만다 페이스 영화 이름입니다. 1978년 9월 5일 날 태어났고요. 태어난 곳은 진주에 있는 맹조산원입니다. 혹시 진주의 맹조산원에서 일을 하셨거나 78년쯤에요. 혹시 그쪽에 관계되신 분들, 일하셨던 분들을 알고 계시는 분들이 있으시면 저희에게 좀 연락을 꼭 주시기 바랍니다. 79년 2월에 미국 미네소타로 입양이 됐고요. 그 뒤로 예, 잘 자라서 이제는 아이들이 태어날 때 도움을 주는 산부과 의사가 되어 있다고 이야기를 들었습니다. 자, 이 사만다 페이스 강금주 씨의 가족에 대해서 알고 계시면 저희들에게 곧바로 연락을 주시기 바랍니다. 그리고 여러분들이 해주실 일이 떠나 있는데요. 이 영상 사만다 페이스 씨의 강금주 씨의 이야기를 다른 분들이 좀볼수 있도록 잘 알려주시기 바랍니다. 그게 여러분들이 도와주시는 일입니다. 자, 루킹포 마음은 60년대 이후 전 세계로 입양된 30만여 명의 입양인들의 이야기를 앞으로도 꾸준히 여러분들에게 전달하겠습니다. 여러분들 시청해주시고 시간 내주셔서 감사합니다. 최인성이었습니다.